Look, I think that we should get started just uh, just uh, to uh, uh, pay respect to people who've been arriving on time. Sure. Yes. So good afternoon, yeah. everyone. My name is Antoine Le Boyer, and I'm the managing director of the Software and AI Venture Lab. And my name is Andrea Vasquez. I work for the central team of the Tom Venture Labs. So today we are joined by Michael Eckhart, and uh, Michael is not a TUM graduate, but he's like me, a Harvard Business School graduate, which I hope will be accepted by all of you guys. He is also the managing director of the Kazem Institute, and this is the consulting firm that was uh, created by Jeffrey Moore, based on uh, the, the work that Jeffrey Moore did in a book that is called Crossing the Chasm. And uh, Michael also is a contributor in Crossing the Chasm, and he's been actually writing a lot of the modern updates, which are in every new version that are written in his book. And he has extensive consulting experience. And for all of those who have uh, worked at the Software and AI Venture Lab, Crossing the Chasm is absolute uh, mandatory reading. And uh, it's particularly great to have the ability to go directly at the source and hear from uh, Michael himself about crossing the chasm about an AI. And Michael, uh, no, 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 we had some elements yeah. from you, and then we'll turn to you. Exactly. Right. So, um, just before we start, we would like to remind you that we are recording the session. And please uh, mute your microphone during Michael's uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, post them on the Q&A section down there. Um, so we'll be gathering them, um, yeah, to ask them at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. Yeah, in the Q&A section. So let's hand it over to you, Michael. Great. OK, well, thank you, Antoine. Thank you, Andrea. Um, you know, we have a lot to cover in a very short uh, period of time. So honored to be here and work with the uh, the software and AI venture lab at TUM and many other people, I think, who are on the call on the Zoom from other parts outside of Munich and outside of Germany, in fact, as well. So great to have you all uh, involved. Um, we're going to dive deep into what it's going to take to not just avoid failure, but really to scale an AI venture. Many of you are already in the middle of that in getting your companies, your products, your solutions on the AI side into market or at least into test market. And what we specialize in at Chasm, at Chasm Institute, is really just one thing. That's all we do, is help young, new ventures scale and move into what we call the bowling alley to really get to the real customers, not just the early adopters. So you will be jumping to slides in just a few moments. Uh, before I do that, the way this is going to play out is uh, we'll do about 40 minutes until about 45 past the hour of some key content, some tools, some frameworks that I hope you as founders as entrepreneurs and as investors in AI can really benefit from. And then at 45 past the hour, um, Antoine will jump back in and he'll be having looked at some of the questions that came in on the, uh, the Q&A and we'll address some of those between 45 and top of the hour. So that's the, that's the plan. Um, I'll also describe later on how we will, um, if you want, there's some no cost follow-up uh, methods and resources that are available to you that you can get from me, including some soft copy versions of uh, some of the chapters of the Chasm book, some of the tools we described. I want to really see in Germany and elsewhere some real success on the artificial intelligence side. So that's what this is all about. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started and welcome. And uh, we'll be taking the Q&A in the last 15 minutes, as I said. That's really going to be the goal of, of what we do here. So um, welcome and uh, away we go. And let me just check, Andrea, looks like the screen is sharing properly. Great, okay, fantastic, good. Um, when we think about the chasm and when we think about artificial intelligence, there's a few things that we really wanna uh, hit deep on early on in the, in the conversation. And when we think about it, and I'm gonna move to the slide that really talks about you know, who we are and what, what happens in the world of, of, uh, of AI and how you can commercialize and avoid the mistakes that other entrepreneurs have done in the past. Uh, the theme here is you know, crossing the chasm now, if you're in Germany, chasm might be schlucht or kluft or something like that. Or maybe in France, it might be crevasse. But the real main goal is how do we navigate the future success of AI as you move into 2023 second half and into, uh, into 2024 as well? Uh, this session is going to address really three questions. You've probably got 100 questions and decisions to make in your ventures. But there's three fundamental ones that before you launch your next AI product, 
or before you redo a previous launch and improve upon it, there's three fundamental questions that need to be asked. And if we don't ask those, we're gonna be basically working in a, in a darkened room without a lot of insight. So that's the idea. And as we think about it, you know, the, the Tum Venture Labs and the software and AI areas that you're focused on, a lot of impressive uh, work has been done and is currently being done. Um, in fact, uh, we'll be using some examples from Germany as well on AI efforts in targeting and crossing and scaling, um, as well as some US examples too, of course. I'm based here in Silicon Valley. There's of course lots going on with AI and with all the various versions of what people describe it as, whether it's on the NLP side, whether it's on the machine learning side, et cetera. And when we think of TUM and the focus in this world of what we're gonna be doing, the book that Antoine mentioned, and you might be familiar with it, is called Crossing the Chasm. Now, in some ways it's just a book, but what it's done is give entrepreneurs and founders a framework and a sequence and a disciplined approach to avoid the disease of what we call spray and pray. Spray and pray is trying to go after too many different kinds of customers at the same time with a new breakthrough solution, which is a major error. And so what you're gonna see, if we wanna boil this down to one thing, one graphic that we really wanna say are gonna hit the key of success, it's as you think about 2023, where do you wanna focus? And just as importantly, where do you not want to focus? Where do you want to postpone, hit the pause button, et cetera? And what we call these are target segments. You can also think of them as target customer segments or target applications or use cases. Those are all important synonyms of each other. But what's just as important about deciding to target and not doing the spray and pray is also decide where you're not going to go geographically, application wise, etc. And so the work that you're going to see in front of you here in this session here in a very brief 40 minute period is going to be basically taking the work that we do at Casm Institute. And we've done this now with 225 tech companies in AI, in cybersecurity, in cloud services, etc. And I want to be real, and I want to use real examples and also very practical. So we're going to provide you with some tools and analytics for predicting where you still have weakness, where you still have risk, et cetera. Who is on the audience today? Well, it's obviously new AI tech ventures, some that are already established. And if you think about it, the entire goal of what we're trying to accomplish is really one thing, and that is how do we accelerate and scale not just to growth, anybody can grow, but to profitable growth in the near term, in the next 18 months, 24 months and beyond. So that's the journey that we're gonna be on here as we think about the work to be done. So what are those three questions? It turns out those three questions look simple, but they're not. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to just scan this page. You didn't know you're gonna be doing some work during this webinar, but if you could read this page through, cause I'm gonna drill down on some of the key elements here, but there's basically a what question, a which question and a how question. So read that through to yourself and I'll pause for 20 seconds while you read that through. Okay, that was a quick 20 seconds. I didn't want to take too much time there. But the idea is this, what we've learned in the last 15 years or more with our chasm work in young new companies who sometimes are too aspirational and too visionary. I know that sounds strange, but are trying to do too much, you know, solving world hunger with one single effort as opposed to, you know, really focusing on a specific problem. So whether it's AI product launch, you know, in med tech related, uh, NLP focus, robotics, aerospace, there's a whole host of different ones. Here's the three questions. The first one is really about what are the core set of possible segments that you should be thinking about? Not all of which you're going to go after, but those target segments are use cases. They could be in imaging. They could be in simplifying language. They could be in, in uh, radiology. They could be in cybersecurity, et cetera, depending on your focus of your technology. And it's not going to be 50 segments. It's most likely something around six to 12 possible segments that you're looking at. 
And we have a methodology, you're gonna see a very uh, quick version of it today in our discussions. Basically the methodology is how do we assess and score and rank in a analytical way what segments to do the following with? Which ones to cross out, as I said earlier, and which one or two, ideally one, is gonna be your, what we call beachhead segment. And the beachhead segment is that one area that you're gonna focus on first and put at least 70% of your effort, your R&D, your go-to-market, your outbound marketing, your web work, everything to do with customer success in that one segment. Now you might right away say, my God, that sounds risky to put all your eggs in one basket. Well, I can tell you that of the 225 examples of companies we work with, there are zero companies who have been successful in going broad and horizontal first with a disruptive new innovation, zero out of 225. So if you wanna be the first to do it horizontally and broadly and diversely, go ahead and do that. You'll be one out of 226. I don't like the odds of that at all. So the idea is what customer segment should we attack first? And so the scoring methodology you're gonna see actually plays into that exact question with analytics, scoring, et cetera, that allows us to get that right. And so whether it's in med tech or cybersecurity or robotics for AI or anything else, you've got the discipline and the requirements to actually make this work in a particular segment focus first. And I know Antoine is a, a big fan. We're honored that he advocates for people to read through the chasm books and so forth. But it's not enough to pick the right segment. We have to also execute. And what you see here in very small, you'll see, I know it'll be easier to read later on, but there's basically nine factors. And those nine factors are ones that predict your failure as you go to market. That if you get any ones of these wrong, and that could be getting the wrong target segment decision, picking the wrong beachhead, not identifying what we call the compelling reason to buy. By the way, don't confuse compelling reason to buy with compelling reason to sell. Compelling reason to sell is your problem. That's your motivation for why you wanna make your numbers this quarter. Compelling reason to buy is what's the problem that's exhibited within the realm of that customer base that you're trying to solve. And then third, I won't go through the whole list now, but the third one is whole product. And whole product is such an important ingredient in your success because you can find the right segment and deliver the wrong whole product and still fail. And so what you'll see in our methodology is that whole product matters deeply. Now my work um, you know, many of you are not in large enterprise companies. I'm clear on that. We do work with companies like this, the Salesforce's of the world, the Google's of the world, the Microsoft's, all of whom, of course, are getting into AI. But we also work with emerging growth companies. And these are ones out of the 225 that we work with. These are some brief examples. But a lot of the last two years has been AI related, machine learning related, cybersecurity pharma, bio, med tech, healthcare, et cetera, all related to smarter ways of solving the problem. But what you're gonna see in the work that we do um, is the following. And that is, I'm gonna skip the drama and get right to the full build on this slide. But basically, you know, all these opportunities that you have in front of you, I'm hoping that you see yourself in one of these nine yellow rectangles. And obviously AI applications is one of those. Some of you are related on the data science side, on the machine learning side, specifically around NLP, applications and life sciences. You know, as you look at that list, I'm hoping you're at least in one or two of those. Why? You want to ride this wave of adoption in these key categories. And there's literally a trillion dollars of revenue waiting for you, not only for you, but for many of your competitors too. And we need to make sure we're clear about the next 12 to 24 months and what you want to accomplish. Now, I've got a promise for you. And the promise is this, is that when we think about your probability of not just being successful in May of 2023, but way beyond that, I've got some numbers to show you. And what those numbers indicate is the following. You can skip most of what's on this page, but the idea is the focus of today is this, is how do you decide how do you actually decide to focus and execute in the right target segment or to right target segments, depending on the plural or the singular, in order to execute and win? 
And by the way, win does not just mean you made a number, but we want you to dominate a certain segment, a certain application. And what that means is you don't need 51% to be dominant. The numbers that we play out is if you can have greater than or equal to 40% share in a specific domain, a specific segment, you'll hear about this from examples I give from River, uh, dot AI from sum.ai from what you know uh, companies are utilizing uh, chat GBT for as well. You want greater than or equal to 40% share in that segment, but that's not enough because what if somebody else has 40%, then you're not a winner, you're not a dominant player. You also want to be at least, so I'll, I'll do an additive sign here, at least two so, two X the size of your nearest competitor. I'm gonna just call it COM for competitor. And what we're describing here is the following, is when you look at data about your markets, whether you're looking in med tech, healthcare, cybersecurity, et cetera, and somebody has 21% share, and somebody else has 19% share, and somebody else has 16% share, and I hear from people, wow, we're the market leader, we have 20, no you don't. You're not the market leader, you're in a very fragmented marketplace. A real dominant position is when you have or enjoy, you know, 42% share and the next player has 20%. That actually follows the analytics of what we're talking about here. The other number I want to put at you is a rather stark and scary number, which is the typical new product success rate. We've done studies on this at Chasm Institute across the U.S., Western Europe, and Asia Pacific developed nations that only 17% of new tech products succeed. That's out of our array of study of about 1,100 tech companies as they launch to go to market. That's not a good number. That means one out of six actually make it. I wish I could sit here in front of the Zoom camera today and tell you, we're going to get you to 100% certainty. No, we're not. But with the tools and methods that you're going to hear described here, we'll get from 17%, about 4X, to about 75% success rate. Predictable predictable success rate with a, we'll call a systematic process to go through. So you're unique in whatever company you're in, whether it's an AI related to NLP, other applications, machine learning. But what you're not unique about is every company, and many of these are clients of ours, are struggling right now with how do we go to market, whether big company, small company, et cetera, on really allowing yourselves to be successful in the work that you do. So that's all the background. Um, you know, later on, you'll hear more about, uh, if you'd like to get a soft copy of the first chapters of our book, there's no cost of that, happy to do that. Now let's jump into the tool set. And the tool set is really, how do we make sure we can drive properly your AI product solution or service? You each have very different levels of, of granularity there. So I'm gonna bring up the tool set now and actually bring that up and have a discussion about how you can practically apply these methods and tools to what we're doing. And so this is the same slide you just saw a moment ago, but I wanna hit on something as we think about it. There's the what, the which and the how, but the one part that we really need to focus on for just a moment is whole product. Whole product is not product. It is not your technology. The early market might care about your technology. The main marketplace actually doesn't. They care more about, do you have a safe, proven, robust solution? And by that, we mean whole product. And by whole product, we mean, and many of you have seen a slide like this before, we developed it uh, over 20 years ago initially, is your core product is what early adopters in the early market typically think of as being really important. But take 15 seconds to scan this, because if your world was as simple as just eight different wedges, that would be okay. But you probably have 20 to 30 what we call key enablers that actually have to be put in place and glued together to make your AI product or solution successful. So take about 10 seconds just to scan this page, because it's a fundamental foundational piece of successful going to market with your product or service. I'll be quiet for 10 seconds while you scan it through. So you'll see on this page, of course, there's the software elements, 
there's connectivity, there's the legacy interfaces, perhaps pre-sales, post-sales, and naturally customer success for many of you as well. But like I said, there's probably 20 to 30. That could be the training required to get your customer to actually utilize the AI properly. Uh, your pricing is part of whole product. Um, your story and message about why buy, all those things are. But be really careful because some of you go, yes, we know we need to have whole product, but be careful. Because too often I hear, and this just happened last week with one of our clients, they said, oh, Michael, this is what we decided is our whole product. And I said, that's a pretty frightening thought because how you decide what whole product is not important. And excuse the artwork here, but I'll try anyway, is this is a pair of glasses. And those glasses are the customer's view. It's the customer's definition of what your, what your solution needs to be, whether it's on the um, generative AI side, other parts of AI, et cetera. It's their definition, not yours. And it turns out that the term that we use is you need to deliver as you cross the chasm, what we call minimum viable whole product. And when you want to cross this chasm and hit the initial beachhead segment, we call it MVWP. It's not a very elegant uh, acronym, but minimum viable does not mean perfect. And it does not mean everything. It means what's the least amount that you need to deliver in value to your customer in these core components and others that will help them solve their problem. And my, whether that's in med tech or cyber or other applications, it is not when you're in a meeting tomorrow and somebody says, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we added something in like this or that, and it's no, it's not cool. It's just a complexity. So oftentimes chasm crossing is about subtraction, not addition. And so as we think about this and the typical thought process around segments, what I want to do is first, as we think about this, let me just, you know, what I'll do is I'll first uh, just jump to primarily this question of what is a segment in the first place. Um, as we think about the scoring assessing process, what I want to do is say, we need to define what a segment is. Otherwise, we're going to be lost in this discussion. A segment is different from a market. It's a set of prospects, meaning current or future customers that are out there today who have a common problem and they actually speak with each other. They reference each other before making buying decisions. That means that those people are in the same tribe, the same segment, the same buying behavior um, as you think and move forward. And what we're going to be talking about today is the idea that it's complex when you think about your world and how you actually want to attune yourselves to where you want to go. Why? Because when you think about this, and I'm just going to scan through just a moment here to get to the right process. Here we go. Is when we think about this, there we are. Had to build this slide for a moment. There's a lot on this page. You don't need to care about most of it. Draw a line down on this and you could get a copy of this deck when you, when you uh, finish this webinar. But basically what we care about on what we call this tech market model is the first three stages. You're probably today, possibly an early market and that's only about three to 7% of the overall customers. Those are not normal customers, they're visionaries. They're willing to accept risk. They take on incomplete whole products, all those things. But the focus that we're going to have is how do we actually get into what we call this bowling alley? And by bowling alley, we really mean a set of well-defined customers in a segment who share the same pain point, the same problem, and they reference each other, as I mentioned. And you might think bowling is not the coolest sport. I understand that, you know, whether it's kegeling or bowling, whatever you might call it. You know, rock climbing is cooler, lawn darts is cooler. But we talk about bowling because it's the physics of bowling that says, can you move into adjacent segments? And it turns out the danger on this page is what you see here, is that in the bowling alley, most sales reps cannot sell successfully. Why? Because they're used to transactional selling, not what we call consultative selling. So only about 15% of sales reps are actually successful in what we call this bowling alley chasm crossing effort. And you can later on at your leisure look at the rest of what's on this slide. We have some busy slides, I know. But the main focus here is, is that in chasm crossing, we need to first understand where we are on the adoption curve to figure out the segmentation process properly. And so as we think about this from an AI, from an artificial intelligence standpoint, 
This early market is the easiest place you're ever going to compete. Why? Those customers are very much like you. Yes, there are those three to five to 7% of customers, something like that. They are enamored by the technology. They're excited about the breakthroughs and they're willing to take on risk. That's not normal. Be really careful about tops down forecasts that say, oh my gosh, there's you know, 300 X million people in the EU. Uh, if only we get 10% of those next year, life's gonna be great. Uh, that's a recipe for failure. What we have to be careful about is that this next stage, we call it the chasm or the schlucht or the kluft, whatever you wanna call it, the crevasse. The chasm is what we call a delay in adoption not by the early adopters, but by the pragmatist majority. They're waiting. It looks too risky. It looks too frightening. It not, doesn't look robust yet. So by who? By the pragmatists over here, the normal customers, the ones who are trying to run a business and don't want you to disrupt them. And that pragmatist majority, when we talk about that, it turns out this chasm is that delay how long can, ta can that chasm last? It can last anywhere from nine months to forever. Forever is a long time, that's infinity. And so what we're gonna see is fundamentally, this is a, how do we get across this chasm and into the main marketplace as fast as possible? And by the way, some of you who have studied AI like we have, you know that AI has actually been in the early market for 27 years, that's a long time. That's a long time. Some of you weren't born yet when AI first was developed. It was first quoted as a concept or phrase back in 1956, but the real early market was 27 years. And now over the last, what, three to four years, we've seen some applications from AI crossing this chasm and getting to the normal customer in cyber, in uh, voice recognition in other areas. And now with what uh, we've seen AI-based solutions coming from, you know, uh, chat GBT and the various versions accelerating that adoption rate. But what we're going to see is our goal in getting across this chasm is this bowling alley has a extreme level of, we'll call it a barrier. This barrier is called the whole product barrier. And it says it does not allow a solution into the main marketplace unless you have truly what we call a whole product. So I was working with a biotech company a few months ago and they said, hey, Michael, this barrier, is that kind of a semi-permeable membrane that only allows a few molecules through and rejects others? And the answer is yes, it only allows whole products through. And so the goal is, is can you and your business, and we'll talk about one specifically here in a moment, figure out what the sequence of segments should be as we move forward. And you know, one of the really interesting companies in Germany right now, this is from uh, Jonas uh, Ills and his uh, company. Um, it's called River um, AI. Let me just uh, jot that down here for you in case you wanna at some point Google it. And for a lot of you, you might be familiar with it. You know, River AI is actually in the, in the healthcare world. And what they're trying to do is remove or solve the bias in radiology with AI. And what they've done a good job of is not figuring out how to attack Main Street because that's not the problem. The problem is getting across the chasm. And basically they're focusing on chief technology officers, head of AI, head of data at companies who are basically seeking some help with what we call diverse synthetic image data. This is to reduce the bias in radiology. And what they've done is, this is River AI and the team have done a nice job of saying, what's that first pin or that first segment we need to go after? And yes, the goal is, can we get greater than or equal to 40% share in that segment for the application? And by the way, the competitor is typically not another AI solution. It's the mainstream solution here on Main Street, the traditional way that's months and not days or hours or minutes to solve the problem. And so due to a lack uh, of diverse testing and training data, diagnostic AI algorithms and radiology, lack accuracy and robustness, there's a lot going on here with this. Uh, if you're interested, look at their website. They're doing a nice job in deciding to avoid spray and pray and really focusing on, you know, elements of customers in the medical healthcare field. And what this really reinforces 
is that broad sales motions will fail. If you don't direct your sales force to give them clarity about what you're going after and how you're seeking to win, then you're not gonna cross the chasm. And I should mention at this point that fundamentally, if we think about the process, is you might ask, hey, Michael, how do we know when we've actually crossed the chasm? Well, it'll tell you if, there's, if you have a group, a sizable group of normal pragmatist customers who are actually invoking and believing in your solution. That's why oftentimes I say, you know, we need to use what I call the F word once in a while. And no, it's not that F word. It's focus. It's to make sure your next 12 to 18 months are going to be focused on not spraying and praying, but real use cases. And so if you think about this, on the placement of where you are, I'm going to bring up a slide for a moment here just to kind of indicate to you, and I'm going to fast forward through, is if you think about this world of complexity about where you are in the early market or chasm or bowling alley right there right now, you need to know where you are if you're the founder or CEO of your company. And you might have different products in different stages. And so I'm going to give you a, a 30 second homework assignment to say, are you right now in 1A, B, or C? Or are you actually in the chasm or across the chasm? So I'm going to ask you to take 30 seconds to read through this page, because this is fundamentally important to our understanding and your understanding of where you are in the tech market model. And then we'll talk about the tools. So take a look right now at the 1A, 1B, and 1C. Those are the three stages of early market, or whether you're in the chasm today or whether you're beyond. So I'll be quiet for 30 seconds while you read this through. If we had the time, I would actually ask you or quiz you about where do you believe you are today? Are you really in that you know, mid-early market where it's truly what we call the visionary customers are gaining enthusiasm, but there's still no real product? Or are you in that later stage of what we call 1C, which is really the ignition point for chasm crossing over here? And by the way, being in the chasm is not a bad thing. Getting stuck in the chasm is a bad thing. So if you basically are moving through there, and you can read some of these diagnostics later on uh, in the slide set when I share it to you. The goal is to actually get into what we call the bowling alley stage. But that's enough for now on the placement question about where you are with your product or solution when it comes to AI. The crux of what we want to hit now is basically, well, let's just get to it right now. And that is, how do we solve? How do we address? How do we score rate and rank? And so what you're going to see is this identifying and scoring and rating process we actually have some analytics we've built that basically take you and say, what are the nine key factors? Let me just get right to that. What are the nine key factors that are gonna help predict for us whether we're gonna fail or succeed in the segment that we're going after? And so I know, uh, you know if we talked about um, Jonas Ills, um, Flora Geski uh, with Sum AI uh, has also been focused and looking at, and I would love for her to be able to score her opportunities too when we think of the uh, ability to simplify language, which is really what she's doing, kind of a, um, a Google Translate from complex language, whether medical, legal, et cetera, into normal, everyday German at this point and other languages later. But basically, what we say is that there's a scoring methodology that says to cross this chasm, we need to basically have a score of greater than or equal to 37 or above. Now, these, not, these nine elements might just look as words to you, but each one of those means something. And we have a scoring algorithm that basically says the following. If we take those nine and get a little bit more specific on what those are, these are the nine areas. And you can use criteria to actually solve for whether or not we've got a proper set of requirements around those nine. You'll notice there's five of them in red. I'm not throwing anything new at you. It's the same list as here, only with a bit more explanatory. And of course, we have a tool set that goes with that that we use in our workshops with clients. But what you're gonna see here is basically, the first criterion is, do we have an accessible, well-funded target customer segment? 
you know, do they have money? Of course, that's important. You know, do they have the right level of granularity in dollars, in euros, in Swiss francs, whatever it's going to be? But that's only part of it. Accessibility means can your sales force and can you reach that customer in the right target segment to actually be successful? That's the first criterion. The second one is, is there a near-term compelling reason to buy by the customer? What does that mean? A high level of pain today. If you're going after a segment right now and that target customer in the segment says, I don't really think I have a problem. And you think I'm going to have to educate them on the problem. Our answer at Chasm is go find a different segment. If you have to educate them on the problem, then there is no possibility of you being successful in that Chasm segment. We need to be clear that they know they have a problem. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. The third piece, of course, is whole product. There's partners and allies. And I should mention, by the way, if you're working right now as a young, nascent AI startup or venture, there's lots of opportunities you know, to do partnerships and alliances with large companies. You know, Whether those are the GE healthcare's of the world, whether those are the sales forces of the world, whether those are the Microsoft's or Google's of the world. So certainly don't underestimate, you know, whether it's an ultrasound for medical or whether it's in other areas that partners now is all nine of these matter. And you'll notice I'm gonna draw a line here and say the first eight criteria, these are highly predictive based on the 225 companies we've worked with. The first eight criteria are based fully on that target segment or use case. And by the way, we can get very specific about who those customers are in job title, in their workflow, in their work stream. This last one is not about the current customer. It's about what's the follow-on potential into other segments. Can we actually leverage our success from one geography to the next, from one use case to the next, from one type of job title to the next, from pharma into biopharma, for example. And so this scoring basically tells us that if you have today a 22 out of 45, you're going to fail in your go-to-market. If you have a 37 or 39 out of 45, you have an 80% probability of winning. And by the way, be careful because a 22 out of 45, people say, hey, that's halfway to a 45, that's pretty good. No, that's an optimistic view. It means you're gonna fail. You have a lack of issues to really resolve your problems with. We won't get into the details of the weighting of these, but you'll notice that the first three are weighted very highly. There's a set of analytics there. And you know, one of the questions that may, came up, may come up in the Q&A, but I'll answer it now is, hey, Michael, you've got nine criteria here. We understand that's based on a lot of work with many different tech companies, but what about size of segment? Does that matter at all? And the short answer is yes, it does, but it's not one of the first nine criteria it comes later, and you'll see why in a few moments. Now, to make this real for you, what I thought I'd do is show you an example. This is actually an AI-based imaging software example. I've anonymized this from a real client. And what you'll notice is that in this example, this is uh, their product is called the ProBioTest. In this example, with the nine different criteria, this example for imaging-based software with AI utilization for large US medical companies scores the 32 out of 45 and a 71 out of 100. That's a great example of you will fail in that segment. There's an 80% probability of failure. The same solution, this is the important part, aimed at a different segment, scores higher. The same AI-based imaging software, and I won't get into the details of this, but it's a really rather breakthrough uh, area of, of work in, uh, in medic, medical and healthcare for regional healthcare clinics scores the 38 out of 45 and an 89 out of 100, which gives you a high level of probability of success. Is that possible that the same product can score differently in different segments? Of course, that's the whole purpose of this. And so your work and what's required is to actually go forth and figure some of that out. So how do we do that? We've already said that there's the nine criteria, but what's the other one? Yes, of course. The 10th criterion, not the first, but the last one is size of segment. We are not against size of segment. We just say too often we see companies and founders actually focus first on what's so hard about this anyway? Give me the biggest, hairiest mother of all segments and we shall be successful. No, 
you're going to likely fail by doing that. And by the way, I should mention that as you think about the segmentation process, that if you're a platform, you don't need to segment. If you're chat GBT and you're, you know, Sam Altman or Greg uh, uh, Brockman, and you're, you're the platform for the business, it's you on the application side that have to think about the segments, not the platform. And so thinking about this, it's nine criteria. And the 10th criterion is indeed that one we call the, the, you know, the golden goal or the last one, not the first one, which is the size and growth rate. And by the way, as you think about this, the, you know, the tool set that we, that we utilize for this, let me just get this moving here, is the tool set and the scoring really allows us to be much more confident in what we're doing. Um, that's something we work on certainly in our workshops. We do uh, one and a half day workshops and Zoom based as well. But I think you can do a lot on your own as well based on what we'll provide you towards the end of this process uh, in this webinar. I wanted to briefly mention Salesforce because they are right now moving more and more into AI based as well as a large company. But even back in the history of Salesforce, you know what? It turns out that they picked the wrong segment to go after first. And they've given me permission to talk about that. The first segment they went after was enterprise. They made a serious problem. They said the biggest companies are the best ones. We're going to go there first. And they basically, over a very frustrating seven-month period, only closed how many deals? They closed seven deals out of 500 Fortune 500 companies. They took a deep breath. They went back. They realized their mistake. And they focused on a very different beachhead segment. They went after small and medium tech companies who were already comfortable with the cloud, feeling like they were going to be successful with that and understanding the power of the cloud. And there, they shifted their beachhead segment and they basically won 201 deals out of the 450 that they went after. A tremendously different result. I want that to look like what you're doing as well. And so if we summarize this before we talk about the nine points is we need to find a point of attack and not a broad shotgun approach. Win market share leadership in the segment you're going after. And so when you think about that, you know, with uh, Flora and the SUM AI, they've done a nice job in basically taking language and documents that are basically complex documents and putting them into everyday language to understand by layman. And they focused on one segment, B to G. That's right, it's not a typo, it's business to government where there's lots of documentation that's hard to decipher. And they've looked at that and focused on it and are now moving into other markets beyond Germany as well. But that F word is crucial. Now, if we think about this, there's one more element we haven't talked about yet. We'll take three or four minutes to do that because we're really compressed on time, which is the how. I would expect you to do due diligence in your work and take the nine points and build out what we call a nine point strategy for your specific AI solution as you go to market. And what we're suggest is that each one of these cannot be skipped. Every one of these are important. And those basically fill out. And yes, there's you know, tools that we use for all these. I won't get into the details of it, but it turns out that what your plan needs to look like, it needs to look like something like this. At a summary level, I recommend you have a, yep, an 11 slide deck to talk to investors about, to talk to your board about. And this is an anonymized example here with a real client. I say 11 slides to talk about, do you have a strategy for winning with your AI solution? The first one is the cover page. Yep, it's this. This granular, it should be self-evident and well understood. And then a second slide is if you click down on the business objective to give a fuller one page or one slide description. And then yes, a slide on target segment, a slide on target compelling reason to buy, et cetera, all the way down the list. That's 11 slides. Have you seen those 300 slide documents that say, this is how we're gonna win? You know, we say surrender now. If you can't summarize in 11 slides how you're gonna win in the marketplace, then you're not gonna win. You can have 300 pages of appendices don't, but don't make your team or your investors or your board read those. It has to be a minimum and maximum of 11 slides in total. And what that really does is bring us to kind of a cogent view that says, ultimately, and this is in the slide deck you'll see that I'm happy to share later, is there's actually nine key questions that we need to address. 
And if your nine point plan doesn't address those, then we're, we have a fantasy, we have a hope, we have a prayer, but we don't have a strategy. And I'll give you an example of one of those that has to be defined well on compelling reason to buy, which is what's the specific customer motivation that will drive your success? What's their pain? What's their process breakdown? How are you going to help them? You know, other ones, examples, partners and allies. Do you have an ecosystem of partners and allies in place? Big companies, other small companies, third parties who you're working with. And so all of this, before I turn it over to uh, Antoine in about two minutes for a few Q and A's, is the idea is we need to be systematic. We need to be disciplined. You can have a vision, but don't confuse your five or 10 year vision with your near term next 12 to 18 months of what you're trying to accomplish. That's really the crux of the game if you think about it that way. And so I would expect you, and by the way, the template is something I'm happy to send you if you want to actually work on this um, in the near term and uh, try to clean up your thinking process in a much more rigorous and, and systematic way. And as usual, every work that has to be done here has to be what we call cross-functional in nature. And by cross-functional, it's not just you as the CEO or the marketing VP doing this. It has to be a broad array of players out there across these different functions. Otherwise, we have a lack of what we call unity and alignment in your work as we move forward. So that includes the executive team, product management, product marketing, of course, R&D engineering, sales support, customer success, and who else? You guessed it, even finance. If they don't all endorse and buy into this plan, then you're wishing, you're hoping, but you don't have a lot of trust in your outcomes at the end of the day of this. So uh, let's take one more minute just to capture some final thinking. When you build out your plan, you know, be methodical about it. Say by when in May are we going to have the first three to four elements done? By when in May are we going to have the second set? And by when in June? It shouldn't be more than a 30-day process to get this all played out. And that's really the goal. And so what I'll leave you with is these three questions. If you've addressed one of them or two of them, great. You need to have answers to all three of these to have a coherent strategy with your AI solution. And, you know, whether it's the big companies like, you know, Microsoft and, you know, building uh, AI into their Bing search capabilities, or whether it's young companies like Sum or River AI or other companies that you're involved in, all three of these matter deeply as questions and answers that need to be done. And so before we do some Q&A, what I want to mention is, uh, first of all, I wish you great success in the coming 18 months. That's for sure. And if you're interested in having some resources, because I want to support you in that, in what you do in your AI and software venture lab or outside of there, there's three things I'm happy to send you. I can have my office send that to you. Uh, the first is a set of today's slides. If that's interesting to you, happy to get that to you. Secondly, if you want a copy that you can use and complete of the nine point template, let me know that. And then we also have permission from our author's uh, publisher to, uh, to basically provide you with the first few chapters of Crossing the Chasm electronically. Um, I wrote the first 50, or I wrote 50 pages in the overall book. So, um, you know, those are examples and case studies in there. Happy to send you all three of those things. Just contact me, of course, on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to do that. Happy to send that to you. So with that, um, let me pass it back to Antoine. You've had a chance, Antoine, to see some questions that came in. I know we have limited time, but uh, why don't we jump in and see what might be uh, the Q&A that at this point might be helpful to, uh, to discuss. Michael, thank you very much. And, and this, is, this is so clear and so enlightening. Let me ask you one question about uh, early market. Uh, you mentioned that these are the, the easier market to, to get for uh, techies like us. So how should we assess the fact that there are 100 million of people who have been trying ChatGPT? Is this an early market of 100 million people or have they already crossed the chasm? It's, it's, it's a mix for sure, Antoine. I'd say the majority are the early market. Those that, you know, back in November when ChatGPT first came out, the first ones to actively jump in and download and utilize, for sure that was the early adopter. But when we think about this from the path of early versus mainstream, what we can say with assurance is that there's absolutely no one in what we call the mature mainstream market who currently views themselves as active users of ChatGBT or any other AI. 
This is still very much in what we'll call this rectangle, which is going into what we call late early market chasm or bowling alley. So there is some of that happening, but that ultimately we need to make sure that we have a level of granularity about who we're going after. But of the 100 million, um, you know, there's, there's 8 billion on the planet. Of course, some of those are already pragmatists as well uh, as we go through that. Yes. Go right ahead. Yes, um, we have another question from our audience. So uh, regarding product market fit, um, he says that AI opens new perspective within existing industries, but also has potential to define new segments in industries. So what would be a better go-to marketing strategy? Target existing segments and bring some novelties or take a chance to define a completely new segment and build the dominance right away. Yeah, great. So it depends on how disruptive you want to be to both your own investors and to yourself. Um, we always advocate that creating a new segment is a major change for the marketplace and that you have enough risk as you're trying to get what we call across this chasm. There's enough risk you have with product and with the market that if you want to redefine segment, uh, that's a bit dangerous. I would recommend, we say about 90% of the time, go after existing segments with a new solution rather than try to create or configure a new segment. Why? Because you have, a, you have to do a lot of evangelism to create the new segment. Um, ultimately, find one that already exists and then solve the problem for them in a way that's much more robust and get that product market fit. And think of it this way, it's really whole product market fit is a good way to think about that. Yep. We have time for a few more questions. Great, then let's take another question from the audience. Um, I had one here, exactly. So um, we had a question about uh, today's uh, extremely fast moving um, AI space and LLM. And he wants to know, so how do you account for how, how everything is evolving so fast in AI today? And where each day a new technology or offering by an incumbent could disrupt what today looks like a unique solution, idea, or whole product. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Yeah, good point. So the, the, the danger is the following. I'm just going to clean up this very uh, slightly messy slide here for a moment and say that one of, the, one of the good things about technology 15 or 20 years ago was that it was hard to enter the market. You had to build a lot of things. There was lots of hardware, a lot of implementation. Now the barriers to entry, and that's what this person is bringing up, is very small. So there's always new companies coming into the marketplace, which is a danger. And the question is, are they going to leapfrog what you're doing as you're crossing the chasm yourself? And so we recommend that competitive analysis be done. And actually, one of the nine points is actually the competition, which is both what's the current competition in the main marketplace? and keep your eyes and ears open for what the emerging competitors are. And in some cases, decide whether you're going to compete with them or will you partner with them and ally with them. So in some cases, we call them frenemies, you know, friends and enemies put together that says, in some cases, you need to be able to build an ecosystem of partners to avoid having too many competitors. But the short answer is, every six months, things are going to change here for the next you know, three to five years in AI. And we need to make sure that the segment that you focus on is one that you can not just win, but also protect to build some barriers to entry, some stickiness as well into that. It's a real issue. It's very different in other regulated fields where pharma or biopharma has a high level of, we'll call it, uh, you know, density of, uh, of power. So uh, yes. Got to look forwards and backwards about emerging new technologies all the time in AI. Otherwise, we're going to miss the, uh, the new threats. Um, I think what we'll do is take one more uh, question. Then I have one more that I came in on my, on my text line as well. So, uh, um, Andrea, did you have one more or should I jump to mine? Um, well, then maybe let's jump to yours. Okay, great. So, uh, two questions that come up a lot is, you know, our investors are impatient and they want us to be going into what we call tornado as quickly as possible. And tornado is to go broad, to go horizontal, et cetera. And one of the dangers is, is that in tornado, it typically is that when investors are used to buying into and solving for mainstream problems, you can go broad. But the issue is, is that uh, investors, board members, et cetera, have to realize that the problem that you're facing today is one of focus and granularity, not of breadth and horizontal nature. 
And so ultimately, we need to solve somebody's problem before we try to solve everybody's problem. And so from my discussions with Antoine and with other people uh, in, the, in the AI space, certainly in the last two to three years, the goal is nail one segment. And then the second question comes up is, Michael, what happens if there's two segments? Yes, of course. Uh, you can go after two segments. But in our book, we say one, because if we said two in our book, then many of you are overly ambitious, would say, well, if two is good, four must be better. And if four is great, we'll do eight. And all of a sudden, we're back to spray and pray. So one or two segments is much better than three or five. So I know we're very close to top of the hour here. Um, why don't we take uh, um, one more question coming in, Andrea, and then we'll close for the day. Yes, perfect. We have one more question here, and it is about um, this process of moving between or from the early market to crossing the chasm process. What are some marker or market feedbacks or at which point in time do you realize that you need to advance um, Yeah, from your MVP to your whole product? Yeah, great. Yeah. So the continuum along that maturity curve. In the early, early market, whole product is actually not that important because they're buying the technology and probably integrating themselves. And those are projects. The further you get to what we call the bowling alley, the more we need what we call MVP, as you just stated, or MVWP, minimum viable whole product. But it turns out that later stages, we suggest at that point we move beyond, but this is not for the initial beachhead saying, but for later, we call those plus ones. Plus ones are nice incremental innovations you can add on later to make something more usable, improve the customer experience, to make it more robust. And in that case, it's okay if the meeting brings up the case that says, ah, wouldn't it be cool if we could also do this? Yes, later it would be cool, just not in chasm crossing itself. So there's a right time and place. We'll put a, a check mark for, for core product is okay here. Minimum viable whole product is here and chasm crossing. And then later, you can look at a much more broader array of plus ones. The reason this is confusing for founders and technologists is when you look at great companies today, Microsoft, Google, um, Salesforce, uh, companies like Spotify, others that we work with, now they have a very broad portfolio. Yes, but they didn't start there. You know, even Spotify began in one beachhead segment. And now they have 200 million paying customers, each paying 9.99 in euros or dollars a month. That's not bad for a young company. They began in the Nordics. They began with one application. And now of course they're all over the place, but we help them segment and focus as they built this journey of growth. So we can't take credit for it. They did all the hard work, but they've utilized the chasm process in part of their work as well. So with that, let me turn it back over to uh, Antoine for uh, any concluding thoughts. I think uh, the questions that came in, certainly if you have more, uh, feel free to um, email those to uh, to me or send those to me by uh, by LinkedIn. And I hope this has been useful to you to really say, if you can answer these three questions, then you have yourself a strategy and not a hope or a fantasy or a wish. And with that, Antoine, I'll pass it back to you and Andrea. Miguel, thank you very much. We very much appreciate the, the, the presentation, your insight. It has speak, spoken to to many of the work that we are doing, I could see so many cases where this applies so well. So I can only encourage everyone in the in the in the audience to reach out and uh, not only benefit from the first chapter, but basically read the book. And for everyone who's read the book, to do as I've done regularly, which is to reread the book every year. I cannot say better. Well, we're we're, we're honored that uh, that that's your modus operandi for that uh, to to do that. And of course. We're happy to, uh, let me just get to the, the page here that speaks about it. There we are, looking through. Happy to send you those first chapters, but as, as uh, Antoine said, reading it through um, really helps you give a, a cogent view of what needs to take place and what to do, and also, frankly, what, what not to do. So reach out. Um, one of your first tests of readiness is gonna be, can you fill out the template? We'll send you the, the, the tool set to do that with and, and to complete the template, and uh, we wish you all the best. So let's stay in touch and uh, thank you very much. Auf Wiedersehen, bye-bye. Thank you very much. And also thank you everything, everyone for coming. Bye-bye now. Goodbye.